insurance is a really you know it's a really important topic for people for all pet owners to consider whether it turns out being right for them or or not but it's something that's often given a second thought or i think often people you know come into insurance too late which we'll probably touch on but you know why why pet insurance what got you interested in in this whole kind of field in the first place yeah so I was honestly, I'll just give you a quick background on me. I was born and raised in Hong Kong. I spent 18 years growing up there before coming to the U.S. for college. While I was in college, I tried to start a company. It kind of shape-shifted 300 iterations of the, the wrong thing and, and ended up finding a, a small home somewhere. But I, I knew that I wanted to get back to building something of my own when I had kind of picked up some more skills. I ended up working in tech, learned a ton while doing that. Uh, but ultimately, I think what really drew me to this space and to work on pets and specifically insurance as the first problem that we solve is I'm, I'm currently a dog mom to an Australian shepherd named Zushi. Uh, but before that I had a cat named Simba and Simba was like my pride and my joy. I still call every single human being I love in my life. So my parents, my boyfriend, my sister, my best friends, I call them all Simba, Yimba and Yimbi. Uh, and it, it hit me really hard when he got sick. Um, he was the first life that I was responsible for. So I felt you know, extremely guilty. Uh, and he went from being what I thought was extremely healthy to, to being not. Um, and he ultimately was diagnosed with lymphosarcoma cancer and treatment cost $12,000. And I was in college at the time and I had no idea cats could even get cancer. Like, I don't know if I'm an idiot, but the thought just never crossed my mind that that was in the realm of possibility. Uh, and, and at that point, what really what should have been a medical decision to figure out what to do next. Um, should I get a second opinion? Like, how should I move forward with this? Like, should I just go running, running around, like talking to as many people as, as I knew about past experiences and, and what should be done? It was very much a financial decision because it costed over 10 grand. Um, and very, very quickly after about a week and a half, Simba ended up passing away. Um, wow. That experience, right? That, yeah. that really stuck with me. Um, that amount of trauma in a short amount of time. Uh, and fast forward the years later, I, I finished college. I worked uh, in, in tech, like I said, uh, but I kept kind of coming back to this because I actually discovered only a couple of years ago that pet insurance really existed in, in, a, in a big way. Um, and the products are actually good. Um, so I'll, I can give you a little bit of history on pet insurance, but it wasn't always actually as, as good as the product is today. And I was kind of confused that no one had brought it up to me. So I became a little bit obsessed poked further, talked to all my friends. I said, you know, the friends that had pet pets and I asked, do you have pet insurance? And of course they're like, oh no, but should I look into it? And with like two bits of information about what it is and how it could be beneficial, 15 of them signed up. So I thought that there was something really interesting, right? So I just kind of kept poking further, doing a little bit more research, figuring out across all the fine print of all the providers today, like what's really stopping people, but also what does the product really provide? Is pet insurance for everyone? Is it always worth it? Is it some combination or to your point, are there alternatives? Um, so I think it's just a really fascinating space. And when it comes down to it, I, I am at my best when I'm building for people that I love and I love pet parents. Um, so like-minded pet parents. And I, and I think that that's ultimately what drew me to this space. Yeah. Fantastic. And yeah, I mean, it, it's heartbreaking when that decision goes from being what's best for the pet to what can we afford. And unfortunately that is becoming probably more common. And I say that because I mean, vets, we, you know, you'll, you'll go online and you'll be like, oh, vets cost an awful lot of money. The reality is, is that the level of treatment that we can offer for some of these conditions has just skyrocketed. But unfortunately, with that comes incredibly expensive drugs. I mean, we all know how expensive human cancer drugs are. And, you know, there's no difference really with that with pets um, and the level of expertise and other equipment that we use. So the costs do climb. And unfortunately, to therefore, to provide the best care or the potential best care, it costs a, a lot of money. And, and you're faced with that bombshell of that diagnosis. And then the heartbreak of, you know, that's going to be twelve thousand dollars or you know i mean that's a pretty big bill but it's probably not all that uncommon for you know a, a a really involved condition like that so you know that's the extreme end of the the, the big massive bills that are going to be pretty much unaffordable for the vast majority of people without insurance hopefully those don't happen but that doesn't mean that insurance is just for that is it so kind of what 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 is insurance for in the broadest sense of the term i mean it seems fairly self-explanatory but but probably is is not yeah 
I think the way to think about it too, and I'll just give you another story of kind of the extreme and then, and then one of the less extreme, just a little bit more common. Um, but one of our customers had two French bulldogs and the first one throughout her whole life was completely healthy and, and really had very few issues that actually made them go in and out of the vet clinic. And then the second one, of course, complete polar opposite, racked up $30,000 in vet bills, US dollars yeah. in the first three years because the dog kept getting sick and kept getting sick and they kept having to take, it, take him in. Um, and I think even if your past experience has kind of taught you that you know, it could be one extreme or the other, or even just smaller kind of expensive bills that can rack up over time. I think just to your point, we shouldn't have to worry about having stacks of 10 grand lying around for that rainy day or that catastrophic yeah. experience. Yeah. So I think that's what it really is there for, for those catastrophic big events. And then again, for you kind of don't really know, like if you think about pet insurance, like health insurance for your kid, which at this point, a lot of us do, like we're fully practicing parenting on our dogs and cats with or without our actual children. Um, then you can think about it like any time that our kid is getting sick or hurt and you need to bring them in and vet costs, just knowing about the trajectory of vet costs, they've increased um, an obscene amount, like 73% in the last 10 years, uh, yep. maybe more than that even. And so to the point where basic things like uh, an ACL tear, which you also hope would never happen, could cost upwards of $5,000 in some parts of the country. That's crazy. Or if they swallow something and need to get it removed, puppies love to shove things in their mouths. They have like as much as we love them and they're so cute, very little survival instincts. They're just like yeah. shoving chocolate and things in their mouths. And that can cost like $3,000. And so I think we're just at a point where it doesn't really make sense to pay out of pocket anymore. And so what I would say is just the broad categories of pet insurance being good for is accidents and illnesses. So uh, diseases, as well as any of those like unforeseen emergencies, injuries uh, type problems. And what's kind of confusing about the way pet insurance works relative to human health insurance or any other types or flavors of insurance that most of us are not spending our time thinking about anyway is pet insurance decouples unexpected from expected. So the like routine wellness costs are extricated from the unexpected costs and only some insurance companies will offer you any type of coverage towards preventive care. Uh, yeah. But that's a little bit how we, how we think about the differences. Yeah, cool. I mean, I think we've, you know, you've mentioned there the, the single events, the, the, the other real benefit that I see in the clinic is say your old arthritic Labrador the cost of their medication over, you know, they might be on that for five years, potentially, depending on, you know, what they're put up, what their, their makeup is. That really adds up to an awful, you know, an awful lot and, and, and can become unaffordable. So, you know, you've got your diabetic animal as well, for example, your animal with your, your cat with hypothyroidism, your, you know, these are longer term conditions in older, often in older animals, but not always that, that really will benefit, um, you know, and your, your the, the cost of your premium will be significantly less than the cost of those medications. But that then I guess ties in with, um, you know, you mentioned getting um, health insurance for our children. Well, I've got health insurance for my children. When when should we be getting health insurance for our pets? Because we shouldn't be leaving it too late, should we really? Yeah, absolutely. And and you talked about being from the UK too. So there's something in the US called pre-existing conditions. And it's how human health insurance was prior to 2008, where pets just in the country are not protected by pre-existing conditions. Um, in, in the UK, there are some companies that do cover pre-existing conditions, and there's a whole host of other kind of creative things that uh, pet insurance companies in the UK are able to do that due to regulations in the US, we're not able to do currently. Um, who knows how this will evolve and kind of innovate over time. But given the constraint that once something happens to your dog or cat, no insurance company will ever cover that thing ever. Um, so like an eye, eye infection or something like that, um, or like a... Um, a skin growth, like a skin condition of some kind, especially like a chronic condition that could be like allergies um, or an ACL tear or something that happens to, to a ligament, uh, no insurance company will ever cover that. And so because of that, it behooves you to get on insurance ASAP, right when you bring your dog or cat home from the shelter, the breed or the rescue um, to get them covered. And I think increasingly a lot of folks are including it in the checklist of items. If I need to get water bowl, food bowl, and in the dog's case, like a leash and, and a bunch of things. And, Find, find them a vet, also just get insurance and then just kind of get it, be done and move on. And I think a lot of what we're trying to do is just help people feel really 
confident that they're making the right decisions that they're good to go and almost don't really have to worry about it in the future yeah absolutely i mean when so for for us when we have when we see a new puppy or kitten it's in our list of things that we talk about in that very first um yeah very first consultation for that very reason i mean i think back so well, yeah you talk about me being from the uk and insurance is a huge thing in the uk and i've i've kind of heard anecdotally that things are a little bit kind of behind in the uptake in in the us certainly in the new in new zealand where i'm now we're we're very far behind and but it's gone from a stage where maybe 10 years ago people you know were were like you were and saying oh, i've got no idea what pet insurance is i've never heard of it to now people have heard about it and are thinking about it and more and more are taking it up which is fantastic from my point of view because then that money conversation and that money aspect of the decision gets taken away which is great but i kind of think back to actually a client of mine who i've just been kind of um you know helping along this insurance journey because we first saw them their dog had a, a very mild skin infection on its tummy just because of how it had been raised with the breeder three years later it has got skin allergies that are completely unrelated but the first decision the first kind of uh yeah comeback from the insurance company was no that's not covered because you know we've already had the skin skin problem now i've it's certainly in my experience actually a lot of insurance companies and certainly the better ones will then you know open that discussion and if the vet you know argues the case if you like that you can get that decision reversed but that you know is not where you want to be and a lot of the time you're absolutely right they're completely excluded and certainly in my experience some of the less reputable insurance companies you know i'd tell people there yeah they just say no and i tell people their you know primary goal is to make money for their shareholders not to save your pet so we've got to you know have that in mind so yeah um with with exclusions i wonder from a us point of view are there any kind of breed specific exclusions so i'm thinking like your the pug that you spoke about or the french bulldog sorry you know they often have problems with their breathing are, are they always covered or is that something that people need to think about such a great question i think as we become more educated on the breeds of the specific pets that we get um, and a lot of pet parents are asking hey i have a french bulldog or i have uh, at a German Shepherd, and I know that they're prone to hip dysplasia or versus the bulldog that has the breathing issues. Yeah. Um, so I think a lot of people are becoming aware of that, which is awesome. When it comes to the insurance companies, I would say five plus years ago, there were a lot of exclusions, including breed specific exclusions, as well as cancer, other like very serious treatments and, and high, high cost procedures weren't covered. Now all of it is covered. So you okay, don't cool. need to worry about anything other than just knowing that your breed has a higher likelihood or is more predisposed to having those issues. And the insurance company, if you get one from a good company and also make sure that your annual limit is a reasonable one, it's not you know small like a thousand or three thousand because ultimately bills can be significantly yeah. higher than that. And the difference between an unlimited annual limit or like a 10,000 one is often very negligible difference between like a much smaller uh, makes no sense to have that kind of cap yeah. um, then i think you should you should be good to go cool yeah no that's so it sounds like the product is actually in yeah it's improving a lot and there's still yeah i mean there's still room but it's getting a lot better than it was which is fantastic because i guess the other frustration that people have had in the past is that hey i've got insurance this is great i can do this stuff and then the answer comes back no we're not you're not covered for this and you think well why have i been paying like the double whammy right yeah. where you're paying diligently for this thing that you think you're getting coverage yeah. for and then when push comes to shove, it's not actually covered or you're being helped when you need it the most. Yeah. And I think that that's the thing that all of us are trying to avoid. Uh, and ultimately, it's good when everyone is educated on what is covered and what isn't. And I think that there's some element to of how do we make the product more intuitive so that most people will understand what is and isn't covered in a way that doesn't involve, you know, spending hours and hours researching, you know, digging into every, every letter in the fine print because um, yeah. it's just not yeah and then preferably having a vet degree as well so you can actually understand what's being written and how likely that is because yeah it's i mean it's the insurance company and it's the insurance industry as a whole isn't it you know you think of human health your car your house insurance and and yeah how many of us read that small print in any detail yeah i i certainly don't um and i'm sure most people are in exactly the same way um so with that in in mind like we've got all of these you know great insurance companies out there that are doing a better job and are providing a better product there's still there's still differences between their policies so what kind of differences do people need to be aware of so i'm thinking you know differences in cover we've got accident versus um illness copay excesses what's that kind of picture like in in the us particularly 
Yeah. So the the three, I would say that there's two different ways to think about it. The first is there's three main factors where you can kind of determine how good a pet, a pet insurance policy is. Um, and I'll talk about those in a second. And then the second way to think about it is also just on the nuances between the coverage that different providers offer. And there are nuances where not all pet insurance policies are created equal. Some of them have more comprehensive coverage, but at a higher price. Um, what the work that we tried to do is find you the best coverage at the best price, because ultimately that's at the end of the day how we make our decisions is of, of all the set of things, find me the best, best value for coverage. Um, and so I'll talk about that in a sec too. So as far as the three factors go that everyone, it's kind of just small decisions that you get to make to decide what plan you want to get. The first is the annual limit. So we talked about that which is to say, what is the cap to how much the insurance company is going to pay to you in any given year or over the lifetime? And you want that to be high within reason or just as high as it possibly can be because you don't want to skimp on when the push comes to shove and there's a, a catastrophic bill that costs a lot of money and you don't want to be capped out at some arbitrary number. So that's the first piece. The second piece is the deductible. So how much you're on the hook for before you get money back. And, and, and of course, like there's varying levels of like insurance savviness across all, all, all of our customers, but it's it's uh, it's important to note that it's uh, just this amount, It's you can choose, it's a range between 100 to 1,000. Um, the most common choices are 250 and 500. The higher you go, the higher you're on the hook for, the cheaper the price. And so it actually does have a big impact on that monthly, monthly premium price. Uh, and then the third and final toggle um, or factor or decision that you get to make is the reimbursement percentage, which is how much are you actually getting back from the insurance company when something happens, which is that's you want that to be as high as possible. Yeah. Um, and so typically it goes from like 70%, 80%, 90%. A couple of providers now have 100%. Um, so once you're done with the deductible, they'll, they'll give you about 100. We recommend 80 or 90 just because you know, you're going to want as, as much of that money back as possible. So that's kind of the parameters that I would say each policy can okay. define whether a good one or a bad one is. Because when you go in and you're looking at these things, you're like, I don't know how to think about these. And so that's kind of how we like to break that down. And then across the nuances between providers, some providers have amazing reputations for customer service, but then they don't cover dental illness whatsoever. They'll cover dental accidents, but no periodontal disease, gingivitis. And you as a vet know that the stats are high likelihood that a yeah. dog or a cat is going to have some type of mental issue. Absolutely. Without, well, it's, yeah, it's 80, 80 percent of dogs and cats by the age of three have have tarts are present. So it's hugely and and that used to be something. Dental disease used to be something that no one ever covered. You know, if I'm going back to when I started, but now, yeah, more and more are are doing that. And I think there's the caveat there a lot, or certainly in the UK, that as long as that dental procedure is carried out within maybe six months of the recommendation or twelve months of the recommendation being made. Uh, you know, so that's another thing that we need to be aware of. Right. And when it comes to your teeth, like your, your dog's teeth, you aren't thinking about it this way, but it's classified differently across three, uh, three bits. The first is accident. So if there's any accident, you need to extract teeth or reconstruct teeth. That's always covered by most companies. Yep, yep. The second piece of dental illnesses is not always covered by any means. Some of the great companies have great comprehensive coverage, but of course they could be a little higher in price. It kind of just depends. You can find that coverage. And then a lot of them that do offer coverage, they may have a stipulation saying that you need to get teeth cleaning, which is that third category of like, this is routine preventive care. Uh, but most companies, unless you're getting a wellness plan, will not cover teeth cleanings. And so it makes no intuitive sense as, as a consumer to be like, okay, would I really break it up into these three different sections? But when you go to that extra level of detail, I think, and that's what we try to do is personalize people's options based on what matters to them. Because someone yeah. might not care at all about that type of coverage. They just want the best value for coverage and not have to worry too much about dental, but they really care about being able to travel internationally with their pet. So that's like another dimension that some providers will just have US or Canada, um, but some will let you go anywhere around the world okay. for up to six months of the year. Um, and as long as the bill's translated into English, it'll get covered. And so there's just certain nuances like that. I think a lot of folks are now doing um, behavioral therapy or like behavioral consultations and some providers will offer some type of coverage there. Uh, there's like holistic and alternative treatments. So really the list goes on and on. Uh, and I think that the insurance companies for better or for worse, I mean, I, I think it's a good thing that they're being forced to compete and need to innovate on behalf of the consumer to ultimately offer you know more holistic coverage across the board. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's only a competition. It's only a good thing from that point of view. You know, it doesn't necessarily drive down price, but it improves the product and the service that's being offered and, and things like that. So I find that really interesting about your kind of copay and excess and things like that. So the 
kind of unless things have changed dramatically since I was in the UK, which is always possible, but it was often the the, the standard was you had the set excess, so that would be yeah, a hundred pound or one hundred and fifty pound or whatever it was. Um, but then actually everything else was covered on top of that. So it wasn't, you, you were not normally picking a percentage of re, you know, amount being repaid. Um, over here, we've certainly got that option, but then we've got the copay, which is, yeah, 20% you've paid off the bill and the insurance covers the other 80%. One thing I guess that, that we really need to bear in mind in that, and all of these decisions come down to, you know, your individual situation and your financial situation and all that kind of thing. But it can be really frustrating to say, well, you've got a really high excess, say you've got $1,000 before they'll pay anything, but then that becomes limiting to actually getting the initial care that your pet needs. So, you know, then it becomes a false saving, if you like, in your premium, or you're only choosing 70% copay. That 30% of a $12,000 bill is still a significant that's amount of money that you need to pay, isn't it? So that's really where the difficulty um, comes in. So, you know, that then, that, there's so much going on there. It's very difficult to compare or to, to, to buy yourself, know which policy is best for you. So, you know, that's where kind of your service comes in really, isn't it? Absolutely. And I think the way that we like to think about it is this is just expert advice uh, from people who have poured through the fine print work with uh, and so by the way we're totally free to the pet owner and how we make money is we have relationships as a typical broker route we have relationships with all the reputable pet insurance companies so if a pet parent decides to go through us sign up with our referral link then we'll make a commission on that policy sold and our hope is to build trusting relationships with our customers like help them with a whole host of other problems like we're not doing this today but our customers are already asking us you know what's the best vet to go to like i i, I just moved to an area like please tell me about that one or how should we think about nutrition so i think that there's a whole host of potential opportunities but really this first problem that people have of i don't want to spend hours and hours researching or even if i have i'm still not confident that i have the best choice um, and ultimately at the end of the day what you care about most so i have a one-year-old or one and a half year old australian shepherd named zushi uh, that lives with me in this zip code male and i want to know what's best for me like i don't really care what's best for other people and i know that it's not one size fits all and so what we try to do is personalize options based on not just everything that we know about the coverage that exists out there uh, but specifically about the pet owner right and the pet owner's pets age breed gender zip code but then also budget range like what is there a cap that you don't want to go above you're like mentally i don't want to pay more than 50 bucks a month because i just i can't do that right now yeah. and i don't plan to in the future so i just want to keep it under there and like let's find me the best one within that range uh, what kind of lifestyle are they having are they super active or kind of a little bit more chill and relaxed and sedentary uh, but i think all of these things kind of affect um, and maybe even your childhood experiences with your pet and the things that you know you definitely want to watch out for. And so we try to take into account all those different things to ultimately score. And we have a scoring mechanism that scores the companies based on those dimensions to get you feeling confident. We usually give top two choices and then you can get to pick and choose between those, but still look at the other options. Cool. And how long does that, um, you know, that process take people? Less than a minute. <laughs> Less than a minute. That's pretty good, isn't it? Yeah. Which is, um, yeah, uh, and and for those of us who have been through insurance sites, and you, you know, you fill in all your details, and then you have to reload the page, and then you have to, you know, wait for the email back for the quote. At some, um, yeah, I mean, it's a twenty-minute process, probably more for for each individual company. Um, awesome. So. The other thing I wanted to talk about and I'd be interested in the US because I think the financial situation and how you, we actually end up paying the vet is very different. So in the UK, in New Zealand, we give our service and we pay at the end. Um, whereas I think in the US, it's often, you know, certainly for the bigger surgeries, you're kind of paying up front and then, you know, your pet's having that procedure. You're then, you know, how does the how does the submitting the insurance kind of work? Who gets paid? You know, because I guess one common thing that we also get is that, well, I've got insurance, so that means I'm not going to have to pay anything at all. Um, and then the vet goes, well, actually, you need to pay, and the insurance company reimburses you. Um, you know, and there's a, a large amount of friction there because we still need to have that kind of money in the available to pay. So yeah, I'd, I'd love to hear your take and your experience on that as well. I think this piece is an incredibly important one because when it comes down to it, there's a lot of people that don't have a ton of money that they can pay for those expensive, expensive bills. Hopefully the vast majority of the cases are just kind of the common 
you know, in, in and out, really not that expensive. But even in those cases, because of how pet insurance works, you're paying upfront and then you get reimbursed by the pet insurance company later. Uh, so the benefit of that is there's no in-network or out-of-network with the vet clinics and, and the doctors that work in the U.S. Um, you get to go to any vet hospital all throughout the U.S. or Canada. Um, so you have that flexibility, but then the downside is the friction of needing to submit the claim. Thankfully, the insurance companies have improved over time, and there's just a simple app where you take a photo of the, the, the vet's invoice, upload it, and enter in a couple of pieces of information about it, and then you ultimately get reimbursed. Some are faster, a couple of days, some are slower, like two to four weeks, maybe even after four weeks. And I think that that piece is a crucial one from a consumer's perspective. We care about a credit card billing cycle. Like I think the majority of us will, will worry about that. Also just having the money up front is a huge issue for the majority of the country. Yeah. Um, and I think that there's, there's some innovation that's needed um, on, on the part of the insurance companies to make that a less friction bill process. Um, and it's also one of the reasons uh, given Given how expensive bills have gotten through the catastrophic expensive procedures, um, if people don't have that money up front, uh, going through something like care credit um, or another service that are kind of like high interest rate loans, basically. Um, yeah. Yeah. Bridge the gap. yeah. Which are less than ideal, but, you know, if I guess if needs, if needs must. Um, yeah. I, I mean, that sounds like it's a lot easier. I remember in my first job, like one of my jobs was to actually to fill out all of the insurance forms, which was yeah i mean it took quite it took quite a lot of time we were photocopying you know bills we were sending all the clinical histories we were having to write our own little kind of veterinary spiel as well so yeah i think things have got a lot more streamlined thankfully um i guess one thing that i'd like to say because you know money the, like the biggest cause of complaints for vets is the financial aspect and yeah, I mean, there's a whole different conversation there about actually the value, you know, the the ACL costing $5,000. Well, if it's us, it's probably like $25,000 and your dog's having a very similar surgery. So, you know, putting that scheme on things, it's actually, it's expensive and no one's denying that, but the value is pretty amazing. But the other thing is the cash flow. So a lot of vets are small businesses. And like you say, if it's taking four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks to get that reimbursement without knowing, A, well, is the client just telling us they're insured and they're actually not? And we're never going to see them again, which unfortunately every vet has been burnt with that. Um, and after you've lost however many thousands of dollars, you become a little bit more hard nosed. Um, but the, just the cash flow of a small business, you know, that is really problematic. So that's the big reason. There's this problem with the speed of payment, whether they're going to the insurance company, if they are insured, is going to come back and say, well, actually, that's not covered. And then the client goes, well, I thought they were, and I actually don't have the money to pay for that. So, yeah, that, you know, that's the reason why. And and I think, you know, there's a lot of friction there because, yeah, I mean, ultimately money is what makes the world go around. It's what puts food on our table as as professionals. And the last thing we want to do as well is to have that, you know, money discussion and that being the limiting factor. But unfortunately, you know, sometimes, sometimes it is. So I guess that's, you know, my, my, my take on that really. Yeah. And, and I think when it comes to doing your job and doing right by the pet and the pet parent, ultimately, you don't want those conversations and decisions to have to be made on the limiting factor of money and of financial savings that are racked up over time. And, and if there's enough right now to move forward and, and have to present them with like plan A, B, C, D, E, and it's based on, hey, here's the best care that we can actually give, but it's the most expensive or one of those yeah. expensive, you go all the way down the list and not give them the care that I think they need. And I think that that's, that's a tension, but I do think that there's tech that should be able to help along the way. I, I still think it's crazy that for folks that have insurance to go into the vet office and move forward with any type of procedure to not know whether it's covered or not. That yeah. seems to be pretty bare bones just to help from a knowledge perspective on both parties of the vet as well as the pet owner of what's going to eventually happen. Uh, and I think that we're going to see a lot of innovation happening in, in that sphere. Like at least there's one, one pet insurance company that does direct billing um, and direct pay. Um, and I think that that's been a big undertaking. And I, and I think that it requires also some, some enthusiasm, willingness, excitement on the part of the, the vet uh, to be able to aid in that process, right? And make it easier since it is a win-win. Um, so I, yeah, I, I'm, I'm yeah, curious yeah. to I mean, explore that. Yeah, I mean, certainly in the UK, the practice that I was with, we did accept direct claims from one particular insurance company because we were, we could have worked with them and we were confident that they, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time, you know, they would pay and they would pay very quickly. 
insurance companies, they do have pre-authorization um, processes. Certainly in the UK, they did. Um, I would imagine they do in New Zealand. I'm not sure, to be honest with you. But um, that can sometimes be a pretty involved procedure, you know, filling out lots of forms. And the answer then comes back two or three days later, which is no use if you've got a dog with, you know, a bone stuck in its intestines and it needs surgery now. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of, a lot of, yeah, I mean, tech, yeah, tech has changed a lot of things and and there's certainly, yeah, watch this space for all the innovation that it could be, but the easier it's made, the, the better. And I think, you know, as vets, you know, personally, I'm more than happy. And actually we have a relatively low number of insured clients. Unfortunately, that is changing, but it means that we are more happy with accepting direct claims to pay us because we're able to better keep track of it. We know those clients, you know, maybe better. Um, so that is something we are offering. But yeah, like I say, that's not the reality um, for, for most, unfortunately. So yeah, there's a whole load of different things that we could go into. And I think uh, at, at least like just from, from the standpoint of all the innovation that's happened on the vet tech side and vet medicine side. I mean, like the reason why, you know, things are expensive these days and insurance is, is a viable option for people is because you have procedures now that weren't available before. You have all of this advancement in tech and medicine when it comes to the veterinary space that, that ultimately we can do things that we could only ever do on humans before, yeah. right? And yeah. unthinkable, right? You have like dog oncologists and you have like CT scans and, and, and other things that I think uh, really move the needle. Um, so I think that that's definitely uh, the optimistic side and then we just need to kind of figure out uh, how we make the world a better place for pets and for pet parents and their wallets. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's getting better. So that's we're heading in the right direction, at least. For those people who may be insurance, you know, they, they are not in a position to, um, you know, to pay that regular policy or their, you know, their financial situation is that, hey, they've got loads of money and they don't need to worry about it, which is, would be lovely, wouldn't it? But, you know, what are the, in, yeah, what are the alternatives to insurance? Because I think it's important that people do have some kind of plan, even if that doesn't end up being an insurance product for their pet. I, I think that's a really well phrased question because when it comes to whether pet insurance is for everyone, the answer is no. And you have that group of people that if they can afford to self-insure and they have you know, lots of savings racked up, like that's great um, that they can withstand multiple catastrophic bills. Um, but if that, but that's not most people, right? Um, I think you, if you also have, you know, a much older pet that has many, what they would call pre-existing conditions, and the price is just price prohibitive at that point, it's just too expensive, doesn't really make sense cost benefit wise. Um, I would say that's also not a great candidate. Uh, and, and I think for the folks that are just a little leery of insurance um, and, and just want a little bit of help, obviously my quick plug is come to us and we'll talk you through. There's plenty of people that we said, hey, it's not a good option, but here's what you can think about instead. Uh, I do think that it's got to be a combination of having some savings and a potential like catastrophic plan where you're transferring the risk of a massive catastrophe to an insurance company and not have to withstand that or self-insure, so to speak. Um, and that savings piece is important, but it does take time to, to wrap up, right? I think many of us, myself included, not the best at budgeting. And so I, I think having that for the rainy day when you need it, but knowing that you're kind of steadily working toward that, that savings, I, I think that that'll ultimately help. And then when it comes to just straight up alternatives, there's, there's actually a couple. There's, uh, there's a discounted um, veterinary plan. Um, so there's a company called Petisher that I've heard good things about. We haven't personally worked with them yet but i do think as we kind of grow our company we're going to bring on more more partners more offerings just because ultimately people want optionality and they want to know what the best is of all the set of the things that exist out there there are also um there's also like a crowd kind of community fund called Uso um, that people can look into. They're actively saying that they're not insurance. Um, and I think that there's a little bit of nuance around how much it is per month and how it can change over time. But I do think that it's kind of going back to the model of like insurance at the end of the day, you're transferring risk. It's also one payment method of many. Um, there are many other options that you could consider. Uh, and, and I think that savings is probably my best answer to that. Uh, but I think you don't want to be caught in a scenario where you're stuck paying multiple expensive bills over the however many year yeah, time horizon, yeah. and you're just kind of kicking yourself because at that point you won't get maximal coverage because of previous conditions. Yeah, yeah. And going back to your first story of the the um, owner with two Frenchies, you know, if they'd been saving, you know, they might have been all right in the sense that their first dog was healthy, so they have built up that savings for the you know, ridiculous expenses that their second dog, but if that second dog was actually their first, then, you know, they wouldn't have had that savings pop built up 
to to then be able to afford it. So that's the the, the difficulty with that with that route. Certainly, as I as I see it, is that you may be in a situation where you're actually caught short because it's not old age where your pet becomes ill and needs that money. It's actually when they're a lot younger. Exactly, and I think there's some something about the data too about early early kind of puppies, kittens, just in that first year or the second years when they actually have like the most claims <laughs> throughout yeah. the whole lifetime. Yeah. So it's like, oh, wow, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> start, so yeah. 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 start to life and end of life is when, you know, the, the bills really rack up really. Yeah. Cause start of life, they are discovering the world. They're getting into all kinds of mischief and mayhem. And then at the end of, you know, towards the end of their life in their senior years, you know, that the time has taken its toll. And that's when we see all these more longer term chronic things. So, and then in that middle phase is when it's the steady state and you think there's, it, it's just fully calm, peaceful, we're settled into the routine. And then if you quit insurance at that point, then you're getting hit with a double mammy where you've paid for years, didn't get a ton out of it. And then when the time comes that you need it, that, I mean, I've just heard so many stories like that. And it's just unfortunate that we have to play within the confines of the way that it works today. But I think as long as people are more aware um, and, and hopefully we can bring more awareness there, uh, then we can make decisions that we feel confidently about and ultimately at the end of the day can give them the best care that they need. Fantastic, Catherine. So um, where can people go to, you know, to get their, all this information about the best insurance policy for them? Where would you like to send people? So our company's name is for sure, F-U-R-S-U-R-E. And so if you just go to getforsure.com, we'll help you out there. Fantastic. So yeah, head over there, have a little look, see what's right for you. And I think the most important take home for me is that people need to think about finances ahead of time and make the best decision for them rather than burying head in sand and going, my pet's going to stay healthy because hopefully they will, but chances are they're going to need some intervention at some point, aren't they? Right. And we love them so much too, that when something happens, I mean, what are we going to do? Not pay for it. So yeah. it's just, yeah, just yeah, avoiding that now. traumatizing decision yeah. where there really isn't a great answer. Yeah. Fantastic. Catherine, thank you so much for your time and expertise. I've certainly learned a lot, you know, about, life in the um the us and it is different to the uk and new zealand um hugely valuable and and it's one that could absolutely save save individual animals lives so really really important so thank you so much for joining us today thanks so much for having me it was a pleasure talking to you